are the, I mean, ultimately, this is what we're talking about. It's, it's our home, it's our everything. And this is, uh, I think this is from Carl Sagan's latest book. This is what we actually are. This in, it's called a pale blue dot, and it's trying to convey how insignificant our little place in the whole cosmos is vis-a-vis -vis the enormity around us. Now, I was working, and I noticed this section that, we're, that I'm in has been on surprise. My surprise was I was working as a uh, uh, research assistant. Uh, the money was running out. And I had a uh, graduate student who was a, uh, an astrologer working on his PhD was on astrology. And uh, I didn't know he was doing this, but he was then approaching the administration of the school to set up a department on cultural astronomy. Um, and the school was, of course, there was money behind this student. The, the uh, school wanted the building for classrooms uh, that was coming then with this money. And I became the head of the thing, ultimately became professor of cultural astronomy and astrology. Now, cultural astronomy is it consists, it's not astronomy. Astronomy is the physical study of, the, uh, is the scientific study of the physical universe. Uh, astrology and cultural astronomy more broadly is about humanity's relationship to the cosmos. Uh, to my surprise, almost all the students initially were astrologers and my training is sociology. Um, and I had wanted to, I said, we're not going to try to prove astrology. We're going to study people's beliefs about the heavens and how those beliefs impact uh, life on earth, both for individuals and uh, collectivities. And the classical case would be India uh, having po postponing its original date of independence because the stars weren't right. So these are real historical things, Astro uh, cultural astronomy as, as a whole, let's see, let's go on if I can. Um, it's a study of the application of beliefs about the stars to all aspects of human culture. And we're trying to, it consists of, um, it's history, it's archeology, span um, philosophy, study of religions, uh, and it has basically three areas, at least as I conceive it, archaeoastronomy, cosmology, and astrology. And archaeoastronomy uh, is the study of astronomical alignments, uh, their orientation and symbolism, both in ancient and modern architecture. And so they're really about, and that's probably really my area, was the uh, studying archaeoastronomy. It's really studying concepts of sacred space. These things are either, we don't know whether they're put here because the place was considered sacred or by creating them, they make the place sacred. But that's, it's a whole area, our classic Stonehenge. And they're calendrical in many respects. And so that was, that's where you get your tie in with the heavens. Uh, a very, uh, Kalanish and the Hebrides. And so this is Bruegel's Tower of Babel, but humanity has this fascination with the heavens, understandably so, and we want to reach the heavens. And so this was an ancient attempt, supposedly, to, to do just that. Um, so the division between astronomy and astrology is a basically a modern Western divide. Originally, they were not separate uh, understandings. But astronomy, as I said, is the scientific study of the physical universe. Astrology is the practice of relating the heavenly bodies to lives and events on the earth. Um, as a discipline, cultural astronomy includes astrology and undertakes to examine humanity's relationship with the cosmos, 
uh, and as I said, this concerns history, anthropology, archaeology, sociology, philosophy, and the study of religions. Um, I won't linger on this, but uh, so astrology, mo almost all the students, with one exception, uh, at least when we first started, were astrologers. And they, they weren't very happy with trying to, having to study their phenomena as a, um, from, from a phenomenological point of view, but that's, that was the only way we were gonna be able to get the whole program accepted in Bath uh, Spa University. And I, always, I had originally, I w I'm not an astrologer, I had originally learned it many, many years earlier, <clears throat> and I understood it basically as an empirical study of the stars and then how people's behavior reflects that empirical study. Uh, I learned scientific methodology under uh, Carlo Lestrucci in, uh, in San Francisco State. And I put the whole idea to him, could astrology be, be understood as a science? And he said, yes, if it's <clears throat> empirically approached. When I was now confronted with all these astrologers as students, um, I learned that it's not really empirical, it's platonic. It's, there's a kind of a preconceived concept that um, is projected on to things. Uh, so that was quite, it was an adjustment that I had to make in, in this area. The horoscope is what, how, how astrology is basically based. This line is the horizon of the earth. Uh, this is Boris Johnson's horoscope only because it's the only one I could find. <laughs> uh, but basically it's taking the individual as the center of the whole cosmos and projecting the planets from, from the zodiac at the time of that person's birth. And then the angles between those significant, uh, th those planets tell you or can be interpreted in, in various ways. Um, all right, there's basically 88 <coughs> modern constellations. And uh, the horoscope, the, or the uh, zodiac, is the position it's basically 18 degrees. It's the path that the sun and the moon and the planets appear to be uh, revolving around the earth uh, on an annual basis. Um, now the key thing that I want to get across on, um, on what we're doing here with the studying cultural astronomy is that humanity following someone like Albert Camus, who um, talks about the absurdity of existence and the, uh, the objective meaninglessness of life. Uh, that's one, one approach. But a psychi the psychiatrist uh, Viktor Frankl claims that meaning and purpose are, in s are essential for human uh, well-being and the maintenance of sanity. Um, so, what we, and then again, if we're talking about divination, it's for kind of partly foretelling the future, but it's also an attempt to uncover obscure meanings uh, within the present and one's surrounding. But I have, in my own experience, whatever system of divination one uses, there's, there's a remarkable consistency. Uh, I've had my palm read by a gypsy in Laguna Beach, California, and by a Hindu Indian in Germany, they both say the same things. If I went to Indonesia and went to a bumpologist, I would hear the same things. So that's, I, and I can't explain that, it's just a phenomenon that exists, but humanity has this whole need, so to speak, to project meaning onto our surroundings. So here we have a Gemini, uh, this is the astrological sign, uh, with the planet Mars, but these are the random stars. If I were, were look at uh, Castor, and Castor is about 34 light years from the Earth. Um, Pollux is, I think, 57. But 
Orion's, let's go, let's go to Orion's belt. Um, some, of them are, some of the stars are the, um, in the rectangle that forms Orion are about 1,200, but in the belt, they're like 2,000. So what I'm trying to say is that these stars are random. They're all individual solar systems that they have planets, but they're not connected. We're the ones that project these patterns onto them. And by doing that, then we have uh, a way of, of interpreting the, the cosmos. So I just have some random pictures here showing how we project these designs on, th these are all Orion. And it's that projection of meaning which is the key thing. So when, with cultural astronomy, we're not so much really studying the stars. What we're really looking at are ourselves. And it's a way of using the heavens as a reflective device to be able to understand our own uh, uh, way of life, or both individually, collectively, um, essentially looking at ourselves. And uh, so that's the distinction. Okay.